Thank you. It, when did Discovery start? 2017? At the end of that season, we see the Enterprise. It only took six years to relearn what the Constitution class looks like. Alright, we should be far enough away. Turn on the extremely illegal cloaking device. Uh-oh. It broke somehow. What do you mean? It cloaked the ship, but it doesn't cloak us. How does that even work? Ah, whatever. Let's just continue like this. Episode 6. It's done. It's gone. The next one's 7. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. I don't know if I want to get to the end of the tunnel, because this journey has been kind of fun. I'm not going to hide it. This was a good episode. I think maybe I like it more than the first episode of the season. And I'm starting to get a feel for the season as a whole. It would have to majorly screw up for this whole season to end up bad at this point. It's amazing that I can say that because this is Picard as a series. What did we get in the first two seasons? Well, season one, we killed Data. Killed Data. And then in season two, we got a what ended up being a kind of enjoyable send-off for Q. There's your first two seasons. That's all you get. There's nothing else, in my opinion, of value in those first two seasons. But this season three, I swear to you, it is written as though you don't need to watch the first two seasons. Truth be told, I wish I did not watch the first two seasons. However, as far as this channel goes, I guess it's a good thing I did. For whatever reason, Picard brings in the views. It brings in the subscribers. <laughs> um, people are invested, you know? People are like... You know, they're invested in this era of Trek in a way that they're no longer invested in eras before, say, TNG, or eras after TNG. There's something about Picard, these TNG characters that resonates. It has a cultural impact. It gets people watching, and it gets people watching these videos more so than if I was reviewing Strange New Worlds, Prodigy. That's not to impugn those shows in any way. It's just to say to you that there's something about Picard, and uh, maybe we find out what it is. By the time we get to the end of the season, we're going to know what makes Picard Picard, what made TNG TNG, if we can really hook in to the roots of the show and bring out the fruit, you know, as to, you know, to see what it, what it bore, what was good, what was bad to get at the heart of things. Heart is very important. It's very important to have heart. You should be easily able to say, what is this episode about? And for me, I can answer that question with this episode. This is the bounty. Um, what is the worst kept secret in this entire season's um, history? The bounty. Why? Look at the intro. If you looked at it close, you could have seen a Klingon bird of prey. You could have seen a cloaking device. Come on. And you knew ahead of time, probably, this episode was going to be called The Bounty. We did Star Trek Wrath of Khan for the first sequence. The Riton Nebula sequence for the first four episodes. What's going on here? Well, guys, it's Star Trek 3 and 4. Isn't it simple? The bounty. Bounty. From Star Trek 4, The Voyage Home. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, revealing the ships that appear in this episode. Forgive me for being a little bit excited. Let's get down into the meat. Let's burrow into the core of this episode to find out what's making it tick. And the things that may be hindering its ability to tick. We'll see what I mean by that shortly. As always, this episode is a direct continu continuation of the last one. We're just in a 10 hour long movie here. Although, we are wrapping up small little arcs. This is the beginning of the Daystrom arc, maybe we'll call it. Last episode, we found out that we had to get to the Daystrom Institute. Not Institute, Station. Are they connected? 
Am I crazy for imagining that Daystrom Institute and Daystrom Station are connected in some way? They must be. And we're finding out that we need to burgle. Excellent use of the word burgle, Admiral. One of many moments that had me smirk, laugh, and do a little clap. You know, one of these. <laughs> one of those. One of the professional, kind of quiet, single claps. This episode, rife with it for me. We need to get to Daystrom Station, okay? It's hiding the secrets we want to find out. It's hiding what the changelings actually stole. The portal weapon was merely a distraction. I don't know really if that was necessary. I mean, it was cool. I like the portal weapon. Hopefully it shows up again. But this idea, especially from Beverly... Steal the diamonds so that they don't notice the pearls are missing or something like that. I don't know what that means. It sounds a little bit like we wanted to have some fun action. So we wrote some stuff in about how they also stole this. I'm fine with it as long as it was fun and it was. So I'm not going to complain too much about that. Raffi, Worf, beam on to the Titan. Um, <laughs> this is how you do quips, right? This is how you do it. Uh, Worf is talking about something. Riker's like, are you serious? I just said it. <laughs> this is how you make Star Trek funny, right? Especially live action, dark Trek. This is how you do it. The quips aren't annoying. The quips are flying in this episode, and they don't feel out of place. They feel in character. One defining feature of this episode is that our characters feel like the characters are supposed to feel like. For the most part, we're having our little roundtable discussion. Uh, the Daystrom Institute is, it, it, the security system is some kind of AI, and for all intents and purposes, the station is empty. No, no, no. Uh, I'm going to have to disagree on that. Uh, doubt. Starfleet does not leave a station like that filled, as they say, with things squeezed out of Section 31, high-tech classified stuff, brought into the public sphere, held stowed away, kind of like an Area 51, if you will, uh, in the Daystrom Station, and not have myriad guards here. We need... They need starships posted there. They need the best of the best. And what did we get? Well, Daystrom Station is dark, dank, dim. All the hallmarks of modern Trek interior design when you don't have a lot of money, All right? Let's be honest. I think some of the stuff from Metallus, that planet, some of the stuff from Vedic ship, and what, a lot of what we see here in the uh, Daystrom uh, station, I'm going to guess we're hot-swapping parts out. It feels like uh, it feels like building block sets. Do you know, you know what I mean? And we've always done that, but here it looks particularly noticeable. Uh, me thinks this is kind of cheap. Okay, I'm thinking I'm thinking this could be budget show, but that doesn't make it bad. It doesn't doesn't make it bad. Like good writing is what makes the show good, and cheap effects isn't what makes it bad. Think of it like that. It doesn't help, but it's not ruining it. We have a little key that we stole. This will get us into Daystrom Station. I don't know how. We don't know how. They don't know how. It doesn't matter. We just put it in and boop, there goes the security. Easier said than done. When we get there, Raffi uh, and Worf and Riker are, are, are beaming down to the station. <laughs> we know that uh, Raffi and Seven were formerly romantically involved with each other. Worf knows that. He makes up some stuff on the spot. Listen, I find that it can be therapeutic when lovers go into battle. Seven's like, I'm not going. And then Worf is just immediately snaps back with, I was practicing deceit. That was just a bunch of garbage. <laughs> Another moment. I mean, it just keeps hitting and hitting and hitting. It, it It's quips that feel like something these characters would actually say. It's so in tune with, with how they're supposed to sound and feel. Again, I'm coming, I'm clapping back every time they say something. I'm just, I'm, I'm on a roller coaster of emotions here. That sounds bad. It sounds like that's counter logical, but it kind of wasn't. I mean, there's a, this episode is 
uh, overripe salad with every different ingredient you can imagine, and somehow it still tastes good. Um, call me uh, just bruised and battered from the first two seasons, but this season, it somehow wins me back. You know, it it, it, it it's throwing enough good stuff at me that I'm at least saying, hey, at least I'm slipping comfortably into this warm bath. At least you aren't beating me over the head with a two by four. Am I shallow? That was some. That was a question I asked myself a lot when I watched this. I watched this episode, and the first time I saw it, I said, "Oh my gosh, I want to give this like an eight. And then I said, "No, am I being fooled? What is this episode showing me really? What is the plot? What is the themes? What are we bringing that's new and novel? You can't win me over by just blasting me." With, hey, remember that? Remember this? That's not enough. It's good. But every time you do that, you stretch disbelief. That is my ability to believe that this is a real universe. Because in reality, it is not in itself self-referential all the time. I'm sure you can understand the concept. But most importantly, when you do that, you shrink the universe... But new ideas make it grow. And I was asking myself, does this episode grow? I'll get into my conclusion about that later. Sorry for this little tangent. We have one hour to get what we need, the information on what was really stolen by the Changelings from Daystrom Station. We have about one hour before they're on to us, because... We're not supposed to be here. Um, We're tripping various different security protocols, even with this this card. And we're also in in violation of a million different rules. Oh, just add it to my tab, as Picard says. Um, This is forming our B-plot, actually. Our B-plot lands Riker, Worf, and Raffi in Daystrom Station. Okay, so we're going to get that out of the way now. What are we going to do? We're wandering around here trying to find mainframe access. We're trying to find... We're trying to find something that we don't even know what it is. Okay, and miraculously, we find it. Uh, We pass over some interesting things. I'll get it out of the way now. Just recently, you may remember, was William Shatner's birthday. He, of course, plays Captain Kirk. Or played. We'll see about that. Uh, We pass by... um, a triple. Worf is, of course, disgusted by this. As for why, if you know, you know. Uh, we see the Genesis device. It specifically says Genesis 2 on it, so they have another Genesis device here. Wow. But we pass by the remains of James T. Kirk. We see the screen. We see the skeleton spinning around. The diagram. James T. Kirk. Maybe I'm revealing too much, but I looked really closely at the text. And it clearly and distinctly says somewhere, Project Phoenix. I'll leave it up to you to look up the the themes and ideas surrounding the word Phoenix. But it's kind of spooky. I thought, wow, we're digging up James T. Kirk's bones the day after William Shatner's birthday. Come on, that's a little bit crass. And then later on, I thought about it. I realized that we saw, spoilers for the rest of this review, we saw, quote-unquote, Kirk's Enterprise. They said Kirk's Enterprise. They showed the Constitution refit, the Enterprise A. And I just said, wow, this wasn't a joke. This They had to have known that this episode would air the day after his birthday. They had to have known. This episode is packed with Kirk. Okay, it's chock-a-block with Kirk. Um, you couldn't fit any more. You couldn't even fit a thin a thin kind of light diet Kirk in there because it's so full. I'm getting ahead of myself. We're waylaid by a holographic image of Moriarty. That's how Moriarty came into this season, as a hologram appearing at Daystrom Station, along with a crow, and along with music. 
something that you may remember from the episode Encounter at Firepoint. I won't get into the significance of that, just know that it's something, a moment that Riker and Data shared with each other at the very beginning of TNG. So this is our hint. What's going on here? Is Data here? This is interspliced with an actual clip from TNG into the episode. You actually get to see a little bit of TNG in this episode, and I don't know if we needed it, but I didn't mind it. It was pretty cool. Actually, worst case scenario, it'll just remind you of how much better looking that show was. Uh, it was bright. It was clear. It seemed like it was at a higher resolution than the show I was actually watching. New Trek is pretty blurry, I don't know if you noticed, but it's very hard to zoom in on anything and get any details. Visual clarity is not really its strong suit. Characters disappear into the background, but you see Riker in that uniform, in that clip from TNG. He's so bright. The colors are so vibrant. He pops. It's beautiful. Maybe it wasn't wise showing that, because <laughs> people are just going to be wondering, hey, I want to look at that show. I don't want to look at this show where I can't see anything. Uh, your mileage may vary. We find out the source of this, and it's data. You know, quote-unquote data. There's a Sung-type android inside the what I assume is the computer core of Daystrom Station that was... And this is where the episode kind of lost me. Data is somehow... Or his positronic net, at least, is somehow controlling the security network of the station like what they just left it to data am i reading this wrong tell me for god's sake if i'm not if i'm misunderstanding this but like what how the ai that controls the security for the station is data but data as we know him his consciousness was deleted in season one so this quote-unquote data is an amalgamation of of recently assembled data information, lore, and B4, and Alton Sung. Am I reading that right? They allowed this cacophony of intelligence to control all the security on the station, filled with something like Genesis device. And there's nobody on the station. I don't buy that. Not a snowball's chance in Tholia would that ever be allowed to happen. It's 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 a smacks of I don't know, not really being thought out, uh, being a little bit cheap with your extras maybe. Um, was there a better way? Do you guys have any ideas? Uh, as for me right now, this seems kind of unbelievable. Worf jumps to the conclusion that the manifest of information they're looking for is data? He is the manifest. Worf didn't say that. The writers said that. The writers needed that to be the case, so they just allowed all the information they're looking for to exist inside the positronic matrix of this new Sung-type android, not without a hologram showing the last days of Alton Sung, who I believe we saw in Season 1? Uh... His research was co-opted or continued by Daystrom following his death. And this is the result. A hyper-realistic looking... We're just going to call him Data. Um, Data Android that appears to have aged. Uh, so he's a little bit uh, droopy. We'll say that. And they wake him up. And... Listen, we're officially caught. An hour has gone by. We need to get back to the Titan. There's your B-plot. It continues after that. However, this episode successfully interweaves our Worf and Raffi plot, which is our eternal B-plot that would never die, and our A-plot on the Titan, which was a lot better. Weave them together, and then separate them apart. You see? We're together, and then we're apart again, with Raffi, Worf, and Riker at the Daystrom Institute. Not Institute. I keep saying that. Forgive me. Daystrom Station. With Data in tow. What was going on in the Titan? Well, listen, we're on the run. 
we're kind of fugitives, and we're kind of going to be killed by Starfleet. Again, Starfleet is compromised. Starfleet security, last few seasons of New Trek, they might want to rethink some things soon. Uh, because they seem to get compromised every five seconds. Um, forgive me if I'm wrong, but it seems like they're a little bit lackadaisical. Maybe they're, maybe they're a little bit too cavalier about some things. Um, regardless, we go to, at the behest of Picard, a place called Athan Prime, home of the Starfleet Museum. Just leave me there. I'll just take me there. Just leave me there. I'm fine. I'm good. I don't care if the changelings take over the whole universe. I'm fine. As long as they don't interfere with me being at the museum, leave me at the museum. I belong at a museum. And I can just live out the rest of my days, me and Jordy, looking at old ships. Let's leave it at that. Me and old Jordy will have a grand old time. However, uh, times aren't so grand for our characters in Picard Season 3 because we're here to ask Jordy for help. Jordy, Commodore Jordy. Thank you for respecting Jordy. He is Commodore. He is grown. He is mature. He is tough guy Jordy. And I was saying, this is a good evolution. I'm down with this. I'm down with Jordy being large and in charge. And let's have Authority Georgie. Authority Georgie? Authority Jordy? <laughs> uh, we're making the pants around here. He makes the pants. Who makes the pants around here? Well, it's Jordy. Jordy and his daughter, uh, his his security detail being his daughter. <laughs> uh, Beverly is the one who gives the hugs this episode. Beverly hugged Worf, and now Beverly is hugging Jordy. I I don't know. It's just it's just kind of a thing. I guess Beverly is a hugger, whatever that means. Um, I need you, Jordy, to clone the transponder signal of the Titan. Can you do that? Earlier in this episode, we were leaving buoys to distract our, 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 uh, our, the hunters who were after us, who were on our tail. We were leaving buoys behind so that they would get confused and think that we were here when we, when we were really there. And that's not going to work anymore. Vedic is getting mad. Vedic ordered one of her changelings to kill another changeling because they got out of line. And these changelings, Jordy, I think they're okay with killing each other. Remember how changelings used to be very worried about killing another changeling? Well, they're not anymore. And they're mad about that morphogenic virus. Spoilers for Deep Space Nine. We defeated uh, the changelings. Well, Section 31 kind of got involved there and created the morphogenic virus, which would attack the changelings. But we gave them the cure. But hey, Jordy, I guess the cure wasn't enough because we're on the run from changelings. And they're a splinter group and they're mad about the virus. What are we going to do? Sorry, Picard, but you got yourself into a mess again, delinquent Picard, that I know you to be, from season one and season two of Picard and the TNG movies, and that's it. I can't help you, because now my daughters are involved, and listen, Picard, when I was with you on the Enterprise, I didn't mind risking my life, but now that I got the family here, I got my daughters, now I got them to think about. And I was just saying, Jordy... The Enterprise-D was full of civilians. Did you care about them? <laughs> Perhaps you were saying the same thing. But back on the Enterprise-D, it wasn't just Picard and Geordi. And it wasn't just officers. There was a heck of a lot of civilians, too. So, methinks you were taking the job very seriously back then. And you're taking it even more seriously now. And you're just saying this to just, what? Uh, just to spit-roast Picard? I have no idea. Uh... Season 1, Season 2 shenanigans aside, Jordy is Jordy. Uh, I can't really complain. Um, tell him. <laughs> I love this line. We can't clone the transponder signal. Alondra, tell him. <laughs> Listen, all the ships talk to each other. The one that's not talking, that's the bad guy. They're going to know that's the Titan. We changed all the ships so now they have some kind of connected network with each other just to make it more confusing just to make it more like all those other times where Starfleet was compromised by some strange technological AI thing except this time it's got changelings involved so it's a lot worse and these changelings are taking no prisoner Picard I can't help you 
I'm sorry. <sighs> Get us out of here. There's nothing we can do. Um, although Shaw really enjoyed me enjoyed meeting Jordy, as did I. You can see Shaw's uh, uh, frosty demeanor melt away and then choke up talking to this legendary engineer. If you didn't know, Shaw was an engineer. And I, I would be hard-pressed not to feel the same if I met him. It would be like me meeting Scotty, say, because I'm a little bit older than them. Look around. Um, there's just one problem. We didn't factor in our kids, our delinquent kids, Jack and Sydney. How do you guys feel about a little minor larceny? <laughs> Remember the title of this episode, The Bounty? Well, we looked around at some classic ships. Uh, we were tapping into what I assume was the environmental uh, uh, external cameras of the Starbase, which, by the way, is stated to be the old Starbase, demoted to museum. I kind of thought that Starbase uh, at the beginning of the season was the old Starbase with some additions, but I guess I'm wrong. I guess they just built an entirely new Starbase, and then this old one, they just flicked it away to be a museum in the middle of nowhere. I have no idea. I'm fine with it. Just leave me there with all these classic ships that Jack in the captain's chair and Seven of Nine get to look at. The Voyager. Seven of Nine has a moment, as does Jack, in delivering a Picard-like speech, middle of nowhere, like father, like son. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. We see Kirk's Enterprise, as I said before, the Constitution refit. We see the Defiant. Tough little ship. It survived the Living Construct, and it survived the Dominion War. Although there was a moment, spoilers, where it was replaced wholesale with a different ship, and the name was changed. I won't get into it, but we do, most importantly get to look in this sequence at the Constitution class. The, this ship. It's there. It's on screen. The Constitution class, not the Enterprise. It's the New Jersey. Remember what I was saying about adding new things? This is how we did it. We successfully merged a reference to the classic era, and we increased the size of the universe. We did both. How did we do it? We didn't see this ship before. The Constitution class that we saw, it's the New Jersey. It's genius. There was this Constitution class ship we didn't know about. It's perfectly logical to assume it existed. We just made the world of TOS bigger. Look, we have this Constitution class here. We don't recognize it. It's not the Exeter or the Defiant somehow, or God forbid, the original Enterprise, which wouldn't make any sense, but I wouldn't put it past them. We see the Constitution class. Thank you. It, when did Discovery start? 2017? At the end of that season, we see the Enterprise. It only took six years to relearn what the Constitution class looks like. And what does this mean for Strange New Worlds? I have no idea. But I'm glad it's there. Cementing this season as the one season of anything that you can just watch. If you finish TNG finish your TNG movies, you can just jump into this season. You don't need anything else. You don't need Discovery. You don't need Strange New Worlds changing into Constitution class design. You can just see the Constitution class. Thank you. That alone won this episode like a point, because we showed the original design, and we did it in a way that is not diminishing to anything else. We didn't try to make it a ship that we recognize. There's only been a few can canonical Constitution class ships, but we made the New Jersey. Thank you. With that out of the way, this episode is called The Bounty because we steal the freaking cloaking device off the bounty that we have there. Historically significant ships at the Starfleet Museum. You know, the whale thing. We have The Bounty from Star Trek IV The Voyage Home, complete with its cloaking device. Uh, Sydney and uh, Jack, our delinquent kids, sneak over with a little bit of minor larceny to steal the cloaking device as the last-ditch effort to help out the Titan escape. So they've manually and perhaps shoddily, later with the help of Geordi, 
install the cloaking device into the Titan, which has happened before. You can do that. You can install a cloaking device. You can have a portable self-contained clo- clo- uh, cloaking device that like integrates into the ship's hull automatically like that. That exists. This piece of Klingon technology has now adapted to the Titan and the Titan is now invisible. And we have a moment where Jordy and Picard are yelling at each other. You stole the, the cloaking device off my goddamn bird of prey. Jordy, yeah, it's his now. And then Picard says, no, I would never betray oh, Jack. And then Picard, uh, <laughs> and then Jordy's like, Sydney. It's cute. The whole Jack and Sydney thing. It's cute to me. It's cool. I'm down. I'm, I'm there for it. I'm down with it. I'm digging it. This show's bringing the heart. It's got the life in it. It's got it's got life force this season. So now that the Titan can cloak, and we've got Jordy on board, uh, we're starting to form our family again. Another theme of this episode, family, which we'll get into, we can now try to rescue our B-plot team, Riker, Worf, Raffi, and now Data. But we're missing somebody. Guys, we're missing Riker. The changelings who were on Daystrom Station, guess what? Blam, blam. The last changing changeling just shoots these other changelings. I guess changelings are just okay with killing each other now. And I, 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 mean, I immediately interpreted those security guards as changelings as well. But then maybe they weren't. And they were just thinking they were doing the right thing just by showing up at Daystrom because someone broke in. And we're not totally compromised entirely. But this one that spares Riker uh, with the uh, transport inhibitor. It's Vatic. That changeling turns into Vatic. And now Riker and Vatic are on the Shrike. And you think I'm going to betray my friends? Well, you might betray your friends for Troy. They show an image, um, a hologram, or maybe it physically is Troy. Vatic and the Shrike have captured Troy. Or is it a changeling? Hmm. When you introduce the changeling problem, it really resets everything, you know? It resets the way you view everything. Who's a changeling? I'm ready for, at the very end of this season, to reveal that Picard was a changeling. What? Picard was a changeling? Similar things have happened, especially in Deep Space Nine. I won't spoil that because it's so cool. But I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop, so to speak. Um, And we're ending this episode off not with the get back here Vedic plot. Get back here Vedic? No, it's holy crap, we gotta get Riker. (laughs) A satisfying setup at the end of this episode. The action is happening. We're bringing the excitement. We're bringing the characters you want. We're bringing the style you want. We're bringing the references. We're expanding the universe. What are we doing wrong this episode? At the end of the day, the, the B-plot on Daystrom Station, I don't buy it. It's I just There's something about it that's just not... Could have used a rewrite, maybe rethink some things. I mean, the security... Anybody could have broken. Indeed, they did, and steal the portal device and also... Spoilers for this episode. Guess what? If you haven't watched this episode, watch it now. For God's sake, the thing they were stealing when they plug in Data and turn him on. I'm Lore. I'm Data. I'm B4. Now I'm Sung. I'm a real boy. What did they steal? They stole John Luke Picard. Literally. That's what Data says, John Luke Picard. And I just took him at his word. And it ended up being true, because now Data has hologram powers out of his eyes. They stole John Luke Picard. But John Luke Picard is standing right in front of me. That's positronic robot Picard. They stole John Luke Picard's body. You know, the one that died in season one? They stole it. As for why, I don't know. Maybe it's Project Phoenix. Maybe it has something to do with his son. And maybe it has something to do with Eremotic Syndrome. I've got my theories. Maybe you got yours. However, in this episode, it's revealed 
apparently, that Jack Crusher has eromotic syndrome, according to Beverly. Bull, bull pucky. <laughs> bull. Okay, he, there's no, I do not believe that Beverly found out that Jack, after all this time, had eromotic syndrome. Who we, we knew it was genetic. We knew Picard had it. We knew he could have ended up with it. And we went 23 years without knowing. And it's affecting Jack now. Only a few things are possible. Number one, it's secretly not Eremotic Syndrome. It's secretly something else. Number two, Eremotic Syndrome doesn't work the way we thought it did. Number three, Beverly's just crazy. Beverly didn't once think to just check to see if Jack had signs of Eremotic Syndrome. We knew that Jack had strange dreams, nightmares, visions, and we didn't think to, you know, ask the obvious question. Maybe he has the same the, the same genetic disorder that his father had. What a bad doctor. Beverly. I would have been like, Beverly, how could you not have known? You're Beverly Crusher. How could you not have scanned him? How could you not have thought to look? Are you serious? Did you not suspect this a long time ago? One of two very hard-to-believe things here. Beverly, hard-to-believe. Security at Daystrom Station, hard-to-believe. Black marks on an otherwise fantastic episode. These things being changed, this could have been an amazing episode. As it stands right now, on rewatches, it just starts to bother me. It's just It just feels like we needed a rewrite here. Um... Hopefully, I'm hoping that I'm going off half-cocked here, and we're going to explain this next episode. Last episode, we mentioned that the entire fleet, quote, the entire fleet is going to be uh, on display for Frontier Day. We find out this episode, Jordy has been protesting that. Good. Now, I can rescind that complaint, kind of, because now I know that it's not a good idea confirmed by Geordi, we're on the same wavelength, and this could in fact be changelings. Cha we could be so compromised that the changelings are now controlling Frontier Day itself. And we know that Vedic is waiting for Frontier Day because one of her officers says, we only have 72 hours or whatever it is till Frontier Day. So we know that we're on the same playing field now. We know what we want, we know what we need to do. Vedic has Picard's old body, and we need to do something on Frontier Day. Good. We need to get back Riker. Good. Well, that's very bad, but good for a story. It's 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 a good setup. It's simple. It's to the point. But we're laying on the themes. We're laying on the style, the substance, the, the significance. This episode, now that we're done with the plot, it's got family. As a whole, this season has been dealing with fatherhood, parenthood, family. Last episode, Picard said, Picard, Picard said, Starfleet is the only family I ever needed. Although now I see that in a different light, knowing that his real family is gone. I put those two together. Again, this episode, Sydney is arguing with Jordy. They're my family. They're not your family, Sydney. Yes, they are. You taught me that. what you pass on, what you leave behind for your kids. You know, you don't get to pick and choose. You leave behind the weaknesses, the strengths. But the number one thing in this season, I say season, this episode, thematically, I think is masks. No, not the episode masks, not Masaka, but I do hope Masaka comes back with the new data. I'm Lore, I'm Masaka. No, that's not going to happen. Uh, if you haven't seen that episode, you're not going to understand that joke at all. Um, the masks we wear, right? Jack, he ain't no pirate. That's just a bunch of garbage. The minute you get close to him, we shed our defensive layers. And what do you realize? We're all friends here. We're all humbled at the presence of each other. Jack, he loves his father. He loves Starfleet. Stop lying. That's just a bunch of crap we put up. It's a defense screen. And it's revealed in this episode. We get close to each other. We let down our shields. 
what else happens? Jordy, now that he's on the Titan, and Sydney are bonding. We let that shield down. And we let someone else in. Think of it. Think of the episode in that way. And it begins to make sense. You know, the masks we wear are concealing our true desires. Um, we're trying to look one way to look tough, but it's really just nothing. Ultimately, at the, at the very end of things. Um, and in another example, the same thing, it's it's repeated again. Um, Worf. He was practicing deceit. He was making up a story about how lovers on the battlefield can experience this as a therapeutic challenge. It was just a bunch of deceit. The reality is dimmer, more boring, but more truthful. I was just lying. I'm glad you're not coming. <laughs> Sorry, Seven. Uh, what else? Um, seven of Nine. She says she was reborn on Voyager. She refers to herself, I believe, as Hanson in this episode. I thought we squashed that bug a few episodes ago. The whole Seven of Nine versus Hanson thing. I thought I thought we finished up with that. With um, Shaw saying, good call for calling yourself Seven of Nine. Sydney does that out of respect. That's how I know she was a changeling. That was a few episodes ago. But being reborn on the Voyager. Having that moment of levity. That moment of just truth. Between... Jack, a, a weird moment. Who would think a scene could be so good between Jack and Seven on the bridge? You know, Picard isn't the only person that Jack transforms in front of, removes his mask, as it were. That's the theme of this episode. Watch it with that viewpoint, and you'll see what I mean. It actually permeates everything. Um, and at the end, we literally have what amounts to data, but as a collection of multiple personalities working in unison to create a whole, right? Alton wished that all these different people put together, competing people, data, lore, you name it, existing at the same time would more accurately represent the reality of the human mind. Will this be the great revelation of this season? I don't know. But there is beautiful cinematography here. The plays, while dialogue is playing. Alton Sung, he says, Hey, realized that what I was doing before was just bad science. Evolution is not preservation, it's addition. And it does this while we're panning over ships at the Fleet Museum. And we get the Constitution class refit. Evolution is not preservation, it's addition. And then we pan over at the same moment to look at the Titan, which is clearly the Constitution class, but with additions. See, it, it, it all it, it fits together, it gels. It feels like we were on the same wavelength. Everybody writing this, everybody working on it. Finally, we've kicked the bums out, as it were. And we've really got something here, we've got a real gem. Um... Musically, another jukebox episode. We're approaching Eighth and Prime. We're gonna see, we're looking to see the legendary ships. Here comes the approaching the Enterprise music from TMP. We're looking at the Defiant. Here comes the D Space Nine theme. We're looking at the Voyager. Here comes the Voyager theme. We're looking at the Bounty. Here comes the Star Trek IV, the Voyage Home theme. It effortlessly woven in. What can I say? Visually. We got the Constitution class back? Hello? Uh, the only thing I can complain about is the interior design. Again, it's weak. Interiors have been the bane of modern Trek for a while. Um, I, I think they had the most money with Discovery Season 1. I think we've been financially on the downturn since then. That's just my impression. Thematically, like I just said... Firing on all cylinders. We're batting a thousand here thematically. It's 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 present, but it's not literally 
writing it out for you exactly, there's hidden themes here. The themes of removing your mask, the themes of, of fatherhood, the themes of passing down things to people. Um, like Alton has become data, right? There's, there's a lot going on there. There's a lot to investigate, and I'm sure you can dig down deeper than I did. Um, Plot-wise, we're moving it forward. We got the cloaking device. Riker's been captured. We're not ending up at the same place we began in this episode. Very good. This episode had a point to it. I didn't feel like I was being lied to or, or being hoodwinked or being just led in a breadcrumb circle that goes around and leads me back where I started, rendering the episode pointless. All too common in, in, in these modern modes of storytelling. We managed to avoid these things. We managed to put in meaningful references and a lot of references that really just... Um, they just smack of trying to pull the wool over my eyes to get me to like something that they weren't sure about was going. They were, that they weren't sure is going to be good or not. You know, here's the Genesis device. Here's a triple, and yeah, whatever. Here's James T. Kirk's body. Um, <laughs> thanks for the birthday gift for Shatner. I guess this episode. How can you go wrong? I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to say that this is my favorite episode so far watched it three times waiting for it to get worse and it, it just wouldn't it just kind of hovered around it went down a little bit so if i'm being honest i'm gonna have to go ahead and give this episode a seven yeah it's the best episode i think this season so far even without all the references i think this would be pretty good because of the character moments the bonding the moving forward this uh, you can it's 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 a real grab bag this episode is a grab bag just as long as you don't grab the daystrom station stuff just try to avoid those weird jelly beans don't eat those ones in the bag they're kind of weird um with that out of the way um, i'd like to take a moment to discuss possible theories i just finished episode six i think some theory crafting here is warranted i my theory right now is that we're going to kill riker Think about, it. it's not lost on me, and I'm sure it's not lost on you, that Riker has been the favorite of the showrunners so far. Think of that. He, he showed up in Lower Decks. He's been around since Picard Season 1. He makes the, the Riker rescue at the last moment a lot. Um, he's a fan favorite now. I think they're going to kill him. I have a feeling. they're not. He's not going to survive the battle with Vedic. Um, I think they're going to give him a good send-off. I think that could be the tragic ending that some of, that some reviewers have alluded to, those who have seen the whole season. Another theory I have is that Jack has Eremotic Syndrome, and so does Picard. And the reason why... Jack can detect changelings like he did in that other episode where he went crazy and killed four of them is because of the Eremotic Syndrome. For some reason, Eremotic Syndrome allows you to see changelings as they really are. It sounds crazy, but how many other people have Eremotic Syndrome? That explains why the changelings would be after Jack and after Picard. They don't want to kill them. What they want to do is dissect them they want to figure out why it is that Eremotic Syndrome works that way. Because that's their weak point. They have to figure out how it is that their enemies are detecting them. You know, these changelings that, is, that have broken off from the Great Link. These evolved changelings who can do better um, shape-shifting than, I guess, any other changeling. They can pass by transporters uh, that have been updated to do the internal scan following the Dominion War. Yeah, they need Jack. They need Picard. But most importantly, they need Picard's body. Picard's body dead body still has eromotic syndrome and so does jack that's why we need them does that make sense uh we're gonna kill riker and we need jack's eromotic syndrome and we need picard's body we need both okay one might not be good enough two is better than one you feel me is anyone else seeing that so far also, I theorized that lore will will be prominent in Data. 
and Data will turn out to be a secret villain as Lore, and they will have to find a way to kill Lore but save Data. That's another thing. Um, another one is that I think we're going to see the Galaxy Glass. Call it a hunch. I'm Lieutenant Merrick. What do you think of those theories? What do you think of that episode? You can leave your comments down below, and I'm going to see you when next time I see you. Goodbye.